everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is AMC production manager, Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of AMC Movie Talk. I'm excited it's Friday, especially because I get to go see Inside Out later today. Yay. Also here is AMC's Mr. David Griffin. I hope, too, to join Dennis at some point and see <laughs> Inside Out, too. looks like a great film. I can't wait to see that. Thanks for having me. And AMC's Christian Harloff. I have seen Inside Out, and Anger is running the controls right now because I'm still mad about Game of Thrones. Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, before we get into the main topics we have on the sidebar over here, here uh, we have two <laughs> topics we want to cover. The first one, it's not major news, but it kind of feeds into a storyline that we've been talking about for, for weeks about Comic-Con. So it's, it's, it's been announced that both Sony and Paramount are joining Marvel and skipping over Comic-Con's Hall H, which is, you know, the oh. big hall. If you haven't been there, it's, it's where all the major studios go and, and present their big movies of the year. Do you, I want to get your opinions on this. Do you think this is like a one-time thing, or do you think this is a trend? Is it, are movie studios going to stop going to Comic-Con, or is this because they have nothing to show? Christian? I do think this is major news, actually, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I, I, beca because of the question that you're asking, um, it, I don't know if it's just a one-time thing. Because if you look at it, this costs studios a lot of money to be a presence at Comic-Con. And the experiments sometimes don't work. Look at Cowboys and Aliens, yeah. for example. You know, there, are cer there, are, there are certain movies that, they, that these studios put so much money to promote it and have big presence at Comic-Con, and it doesn't pay off. It's a big marketing thing, and it, it might work for the people that are there. But overall... You, you know, the people that are maybe watching or hearing the news, there's a particular amount of stories that will make the news. Obviously, like Batman v Superman, I think it's beneficial for them to be there this year, even though they don't necessarily need it either. But uh, this uh, this has been kind of in the rumor mill for, a, for the, at least the last past two years that studios are going to start scaling back on Comic-Con and appearing at these other cons in general and just kind of using their time. And I also think it has a lot to do with the Comic Con being at San Diego, they they need to change that space or expand it. It's too small. There's too many people. It's becoming a, a mess. So I think eventually, either more studios will pull out, or they're going to find other venues to do it. David, yeah, I think I mean I think when Marvel, the the big dog, is pulling out, they have their own. They have the Marvel experience, you know, this year, and uh, they're doing their own thing. They have D two three, of course, you know, at Disney. And I, I think that they're showing that they don't need to spend tons of money to do that. I, I agree with Christian. I think it's going to be a trend, but it kind of gives me hope in a way too. I mean, just I'm just speaking about Comic Con in general because it's so hard for fans to get into Comic Con. Hopefully, this will force San Diego to expand or to move to L A. or Vegas, or because I want I wish more people could see Comic Con. You know, not just for the movies, but for everything else there. So. Uh, I do think it's going to be a growing trend. I don't think they, like Christian, I don't think they have to come. For me, my preference is for it to stay in San Diego, but obviously it's not. I want them to expand the whole place right. so they can mm -hmm. fit everything they need to. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a growing trend. I do think that maybe because Sony and, and Paramount don't have that much to show this year, that I think studios are going to get smarter about it in, in the sense of, we're not going to go to Comic Con just to go to Comic Con, mm -hmm. and like they're going to wait till they have maybe two or three movies that they want to push, so that when they go there, they have like a, a agenda. So I think this year the only thing Sony would be pushing is Spectre yeah. and Paramount only Mission Impossible: uh, Rogue Nation. So I don't think those and those don't really fall totally in the category of you know what Comic Con is. You know, you talk about Batman v Superman. Obviously, that's going to be there. Do they need the help? No, but it, it doesn't hurt to rile up the the, the fan base. Right. To, it's also to, fitting for Comic Con yes. for Batman yeah. v Superman yeah. and Aquaman, and it, it makes sense for them to be there. And then we have Star Wars is going to be there, right. and then also uh, Hunger Games: Mockingjay Part Two. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I just feel like maybe they'll be back next year. Now next year is the big thing. Like if Marvel and the other two or other studios don't show up, then there might be an issue. I wonder also if they look, if both Marvel and now Sony and Paramount see, look at numbers after their movies come out this year and see if there's any uh, lack of buzz or lack mm -hmm. of talk about some of their properties and say, well, maybe we should be there or, or do some other things. Because I just think it's, it's as far as what it costs the studios to be there, I agree with you, Dennis, 100%. Unless you have something in that realm or that you know fits the comic-con lore then it makes sense star wars should be there because yes. it, was, it was star wars was really the one that kind of started it off in seven in, when they were promoting the movie in like 76 when it was nothing it was one mm -hmm. of the first movies to ever promote at comic-con so it's kind of traditional for them to do it 
Um, but Marvel needs to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not this year. Maybe it's strategic because I think D23 this year is going to be big. I think it's going to be, that's really where they're going to show a lot of different things. So who knows? Well, I think it's just interesting to see that uh, it was just announced, I think, recently that uh, Star Wars set another Guinness Book of World Records setting with the YouTube viewings for its, uh, its, its newest trailer. Uh, I think it's highest uh, or fastest, most watched uh, trailer in 24-hour period on mm -hmm. YouTube. So, I mean, like, do they... Do you need? I mean, is that better marketing? Just dumping it on YouTube and let Twitter and the social media universe just spread it out, or do they have to spend I don't know how many thousands, or hundreds of thousands of dollars it costs to go to Comic Con instead of big displays, right. which is more beneficial. But they for did them. have a big display this year for Star Wars right. Celebration, right. even though it was their celebration. Right. There was something to. I, I thought it was really smart the way that they did a live stream that you could, as you were, everybody could yes. watch that. And mm -hmm. then, because you're so excited with this presentation that they did, that hyped up more trailer, more talk about it. So I think that, I don't know if they're going to be live streaming this year. I think the live streaming idea is brilliant. I think they should do more of that type of stuff. But I don't know what the capacity for Comic Con and Hall H and what they can do. This is what Comic Con needs. They need live streaming. Just got yeah. back from, just, we had E3, PlayStation, you know, Microsoft, all live streaming. You can watch all the press conferences so everybody can experience. The news and the joy of everything's being unveiled. Comic Con need, needs live streaming. Yeah, because you're getting more bang for your buck. Yeah. If you're a studio and you go into Hall H and that's live streaming, you get everyone that's there and then everyone that they can't be there. Because you know how many people always say, Oh, I wish I could go to Comic Con, but I can't afford to. I don't have the right. time or the money. So if they can watch it on the on the live stream like E3, then I think that what that's what it comes down to is that they want to do this thing to where it's because you spent that money on the ticket for Comic Con, they're like, well, this is just for you guys. This is just this, yeah. this part, and they did that at Celebration for Rogue One. They did that, but I agree with you guys where I think you should do both because even though you're giving something special to those fans who paid for the tickets you're also hurting yourself by not showing everybody what's going on because there's t there's times i remember when that green lantern when before, before we knew what a turd it was going to be but when we <laughs> when we saw we saw that it was like a five minute presentation that happened at comic-con it was fantastic the way that they had cut that thing together but you could only find it leaked it was only for comic-con i thought that would have helped the movie a lot more had they just Release that the same way like Star Wars did, or live streaming. Let everybody see that. Oh, what's that all about? And then you know, the time people got in, they go, "Oh, maybe we shouldn't see that." Yeah, I don't think Comic Con has to worry about uh, anybody not going to Comic Con because they're live streaming it. Because right. you went to Star Wars Celebration, right? Yeah. You knew there was going to be a live stream for that, but you went anyway. Why? Because you wanted to experience wanted, yeah. the energy. Totally, right? I, absolutely. So I don't think Comic Con has to worry about that. It's like going to a sports. Uh, it's like going to any game. You know, yeah. you can't like, compare yeah. it to watching it at home. No, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's but the, but it, you know, if I can't get a ticket to the game, as long as I can watch it, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, we have another uh, subject that uh, that Christian, you you want to tell us about? Yeah, I saw this morning. Now, just I want to let everybody know first of all that it, it hasn't been confirmed yet. But uh, buddies that we use very often on AMC Jedi Council, Star Wars Seven News dot com, got their hands on three photos of characters from the Force Awakens. Now, you look yesterday. We were actually talking about with Jermaine Lucier and, and Mark Ellis. We we're talking about what Greg Gunberg's role was going to be in this, and Jermaine to his credit, said he wouldn't be surprised if he turned out to be a pilot in the Rebel working working with uh, Oscar Isaac. And it looks like, look at that, he's a, pi he's a pilot now for the Rebellion. And then look who's back, Neem Num and General <laughs> Akbar. They oh. are back. And that that was, I, I'm so excited to see both those guys. I Like, you, you wonder why Neem Num hasn't changed his clothes, but it doesn't matter. You look at also uh, General Akbar. I love that he is back and he's going to be grunting and being his grouchy old self, calling some orders. And who knows what his role is in this new rebellion or whatever the new government is. So it's nice if these are indeed official. It's nice to see the gang back. Well, Ninum, okay, he's wearing the same clothes, but Admiral Akbar, he looks like he came up, like he came into right. some money, right? Yeah. Like he's like, oh, I don't have to dress in that anymore. Good I got these nice clothes. Yeah. Um, and then Greg Gunberg, he looks like. He looks like he could be a Porkins like son or something like that. I don't know, David. What do you think? It looks good. I mean, I, I love seeing these guys back. You know, I was talking about E3 earlier, getting to play uh, Star Wars Battlefront. So just you know, you get to hear these voices and these guys just coming back into the fold. I mean, I'm just excited that Star Wars is. We're gonna just, we have a Star Wars movie coming out this year, and I know I keep saying that, but it's just. I don't think it's sunk in. I don't think it will sink in until I actually go see this thing in December at an AMC theater. And then watch it 10 times. 10 times, at least. Yeah. At least 10 times. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to see all these guys start popping back. And it also, there was also other leaked photos that we didn't want to post mm -hmm. because it looked like it came like straight from the movie. So 
We're not going to post that, but if you want to go for yourself, <laughs> you can go check it out. I guess they're in some other places. All right, Sinead, what's our first topic? The new all-female Ghostbusters reboot movie began filming yesterday in Boston, and several pictures have been making their way online. These set photos show Kristen Wiig wearing business attire, Melissa McCarthy in casual clothes, while Casey McKinnon seems to be wearing a leather jacket on top of paint-covered overalls. The other Ghostbusters team member, Leslie Jones, was not seen on set. The Boston Herald wrote this unofficial synopsis for the film. Wig and McCarthy play a pair of unheralded authors who write a book positing that ghosts are real. Flash forward a few years and Wig lands a prestigious teaching job at Columbia U, which is pretty sweet until her book resurfaces and she is laughed out of academia. Wig reunites with McCarthy and the other two proton pack pack proton pack pack packing <laughs> phantom wranglers <laughs> and she gets some sweet revenge when ghosts invade Manhattan and she and her team have to save the world. Ghostbusters is being directed by Bridesmaids and the Heat director Paul Feig and hits AMC theaters on July 22nd, 2016. Dennis, what do you think of the first look at the female Ghostbusters and what the story will be? Um, uh, before I had read the synopsis, I, I saw these pictures and I was wondering, I was like, why are they all wearing different types of outfits but after reading the synopsis it now makes sense though i don't know i still don't know what casey mckinnon is doing in in that outfit but i'm excited for this you know there's a lot of online hatred for for this female all female ghostbusters reboot movie but I, i'm really looking forward to it I, I don't think it's a situation where i can understand if let's say they they take a character like james bond and they make it a female or something because because james bond inherent in his character is being a guy you know right, right where the ghostbusters i feel like was less about them being guys and more about them being kind of goofy and immature so having an all-female cast I, I i'm all for it and i'm excited david yeah i i don't have any hate for this movie i wasn't that excited about it when i first heard it but then after seeing uh jurassic world and just how much fun that was. I feel like it could be a movie like that. Maybe it's not going to have... It, Ghostbusters aren't known for their storytelling. It's not going to be like some you know deep story or anything, but it's always just entertaining and fun to watch. Their camaraderie, they, they just the banter off of each other. And these actresses are talented. I mean, they, they, they can pull this off. I love Melissa McCarthy's kind of geek uh, girl look there. I think, I think she looks awesome. I, I think this is going to be a really fun film. Christian? Um, actually, guys, the actress's name is Kate McKinnon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually really am a big fan of Kate McKinnon from Saturday Night Live, and I, I'm looking forward to see what her and Leslie Jones, even though she's not on this on these pictures, see what they can do. Because I'm, what I'm worried about is if it's just Melissa McCarthy mm -hmm. and Kristen Wiig, it's just going to be their show again that we've seen a thousand times over. But the actual synopsis, the reason I, when I first hear it, I go, it just sounds like a rehash of the first movie. And I kind of almost wished it was a spinoff to where it was continuing the line of, Maybe she wrote a book about what Bill Murray and those guys did. Mm -hmm. And then that, because it was such a long time ago, it, it's over. Whatever it was, I was kind of hoping it would still stay in that mythology. But there's two words, and it's Paul Feig. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the reason I go in going, okay, I'm going to give this thing a shot. Because I've enjoyed the last three movies that this guy's done. And he's worked with a lot of these actresses before. He gets comedy. He's, a, he's gone after this for a reason. Um, this, could, this is a good team so far, and you need a good team for this movie. So... I'm definitely I'm 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 not just gonna poo poo it. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to go in there and I'm gonna go in open minded. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. What's next? Deadline is reporting that Tom Hanks is in talks to star and director Clint Eastwood's movie version of pilot Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger's heroic landing of a crippled plane on the Hudson River in 2009, saving the lives of 155 people. The film will be based on the book Highest Duty, My Search for What Really Matters by Sullenberger and Jeffrey Zaslow. Christian, what do you think of the casting of Tom Hanks? It's perfect. I mean, like even Sully when he's landing the plane goes, "Oh, Tom Hanks is probably gonna play me in this movie as I'm landing," <laughs> because it's it's perfect casting. You have you can see it if you envision it. And I told you what this story is about. If it if it wasn't a true story, and I said, "What actor do you think is gonna play this?" Most people, Tom Hanks would be in that top three, mm -hmm. I think. And working with Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood for me has been a little hit and miss lately. Um, I thought American Sniper was good. I hated Jersey Boys, mm -hmm. but there's he's still one of the more respected directors and to work with one of the most res not respect only respected actors but producers as well um with this story and what this guy did and how he saved these lives and i want to see really not just not just that event but really what led up to it what happened afterwards and i think tom hanks is that guy that be it benefits to have him in there to tell that story 
David? Yeah, I, I agree with, with you, Christian. I think Tom Hanks is he's incredible. You can't really – it's never bad to have him in a movie, you know. He's, mm-hmm. he's always going to be a good addition. My only worry again is for Clint Eastwood. I mean, my I, I'm from Michigan, so I love Gran Torino. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before that, I mean, yeah, Flags for Our Fathers and Letters for Iwo Jima are the only two – Films of Fleetwood's Woods in the last ten years that I've really liked. I mean, I, his last, you know, like Changeling, and you know, it's just uh, 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 Edgar, you know, with Leo. Oh, I mean, there's some yeah. good performances in mm-hmm. there, but I just haven't. Yeah. I, when was the last time you were actually psyched to see a Clint Eastwood film? Uh, Army Hammer was playing the Six, Pla- Six Flags old man. Right. So yeah. I mean, I think that's my only reservation is that Clint Eastwood hasn't wowed me in probably you know nine years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For me, yeah, Tom Hanks. It seems like a natural fit. He played a uh, Captain Banks in a uh, or not Banks uh, Phillips. Captain Phillips. Right. He played a uh, Walt, Walt Disney, Disney yeah, in yeah, Saving yeah. Mr. Right. Banks. That's where I got confused. Captain there. Banks is a sequel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's a natural fit. I'm wondering how they're going to take this story. They they've got to do you know before and after yeah. because the actual incident was. How long? How long is that scene going to be? Like 15, yeah, 20 minutes? Yeah, probably fifteen, twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, is is, is Clint Eastwood going to try and make the birds out to be some sort of like villains, or you know, they have like motivation for trying to take the plane right. down? I don't know, but I guess the the, most, the birds yeah, over. <laughs> the most interesting part I want to see is the afterwards because they talked about that that during the actual. Um, I guess uh, landing mm-hmm. that that, that uh, Captain Sully was very calm and collect cool and collective, and they said that he's kind of like that in person, uh, in general. But they said afterwards, like he had uh, post traumatic stress, oh, yeah. you know, and that he would have flashbacks and nightmares and stuff like that. And so, someone like Tom Hanks, I think, can do that very well. I mean, if you saw the last what was it, five ten minutes yeah, of exactly uh, Captain Phillips. Yeah. Which, you know, that almost got him an Oscar nomination just for that scene. This reminds me also, the story, uh, even this true story, reminds me of a, a sober version of Flight with Denzel Washington. Yeah. You know, and that's, and Tom Hanks is the guy you want to see. And you're right. It's that last, and he didn't even nominate it, did he? No, no he didn't. No. That last five minutes of that movie, and I know exactly what scene you're talking yeah. about, sh- you, that alone should have gotten him a nomination or maybe even the win. But the, yeah, that's that's the guy that should be flying that plane. Yeah. All right, uh, now on to our buy or sell segment. Sinead, what do we got? The first trailer for Kung Fu Panda 3 has hit the web. The story this time revolves around Poe, voiced by Jack Black, reuniting with his long-lost father, Lee, voiced by Brian Cranston. Also returning are Tigress, voiced by Angelina Jolie, Monkey, voiced by Jackie Chan, Mantis, voiced by Seth Rogen, Crane, voiced by David Cross, Viper, voiced by Lucy Liu, and Master Shifu, voiced by Dustin Hoffman. Kung Fu Panda 3 opens in AMC theaters on January 29th, 2016. David, do you buy or sell the first trailer? I sell this, and this is coming from a guy who loves animation. Uh, hopefully, seeing Inside Out today. Uh, I, I just, I always thought this was a lesser franchise mm-hmm. of the animation franchises out right now, compared to How to Train Your Dragon, compared to uh, Despicable Me. And now, I'm more pumped about seeing the Minions than I am Kung Fu Panda Three. I just, I feel like it's just, it's run its course. It's just not. I don't think it's one of the better crafted stories out there. Uh, and that's not, I, again, I love animation. I, I love kids' movies, but this one just doesn't, it doesn't impress me. That trailer just, the whole bit with the, like, oh, you're, you know, not realizing who this mm-hmm. person is, like, you're not my dad or whatever. It just, I, I didn't laugh once when I watched it. Maybe I'm not cold hearted. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Christian? Uh, I'll buy the trailer for, for what it was. I'll, I'll sell the release date, though. Uh, uh, January, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what scares me about it because the first one came out in June or May. Or whatever. One of them came out in May, one of them came out yeah. in June. This, and now to throw that in January, that means even though the trailer for me was it was cute enough, I don't, yeah. uh, but I'm going to agree with David where this is, I think it might have run its course because, and I think the studio might have thought at this point it's run its course because to put it out in January, that's interesting to me. This was a summer movie that that performed for them and i wonder why it's in january and the the trailer itself it's not really a trailer it's just that scene of him talking with his dad but i i did enjoy it even though i agree with you it's a bit cliched and we've seen it before you know and i watched it with my daughter too so maybe that's why but <laughs> but as far as where the release date's the one i'm going to sell so i'll sell the release date and i'll buy the the little scene yeah i i didn't mind the scene as well uh, I'll, I'll i'll buy this not wholeheartedly i also like i like enjoyed the first two but I never thought, oh, I need to see another Kung Fu Panda 3. Right. I like the addition of Brian Cranston. I, I know the first two, 
made a good chunk of change, though. They, they cost, I think, $130, $150 million. They end up making over $600 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Sinead, did you watch the trailer for I it? I did. Did you like it? I mean, Kung Fu Panda just has never done it for me. Like, I've never been stoked on... I wasn't stoked on a Kung Fu Panda 2, so mm-hmm. I'm not very stoked on a 3. But if we're just talking about this, like, it's all right. I didn't laugh my butt off or anything. But it's okay. okay. All right, what's next? Lionsgate has released the first trailer for director Denis Villeneuve's movie Sicario, starring Emily Blunt, Josh Brolin, and Benicio Del Toro. The film is about an FBI agent, played by Blunt, that becomes involved in the war on drugs at the U.S.-Mexican border. Sicario comes to AMC Theaters on September 18th, 2015. Dennis, do you buy or sell the trailer? Oh, I big buy for me. I mean, I loved uh, Prisoners and uh, Denis Villeneuve. Uh, he's teamed up with Roger Deakins for his last, what, three movies? And two, they're three doing movies? Blade Runner together. And he, yeah, they're doing Blade yeah. Runner 2 together. And what he did so well in Prisoners was the tension and the suspense, and you got that from this trailer. And Emily Blunt playing these type of strong female characters that, that she did in uh, uh, Edge of Tomorrow and Looper, and she's doing it again in this one. I, I'm excited for this one. Christian? Uh, huge buy. Uh, because I not only like Prisoners, I really liked Enemy mm-hmm. as well. Love what this guy is doing. This trailer had a, had a bit of like traffic. It felt like traffic. Um, but Emily Blunt, what I liked about it, yes, she's been playing these strong roles in Edge of Tomorrow and in Looper. But this one seems to have that strong character. But there's also a bit of vulnerability too, to where she's. It looks like she's on the side of. I, I I'm in this job. I'm I'm committed to this job but then there's this darkness of this job and this new mission that i've got to really explore and it looks like there's corruption it looks like josh brolin is going to be having his nose in corruption again and benicio del toro man like when dave and i were talking about it off air when that guy does it right you can't take your eyes off him and it seems like it's one of those roles that's why i think i went back to traffic right away because it was similar to him in that movie but yeah villanueva is that is one of those new directors that you just hear he's doing anything and you go i'm in because of the movie looks beautiful from the trailer it was a two and a half minutes or whatever it was and it's just you can tell it, th- there's certain directors that are stars and they become like you, you have Tarantino and Nolan and dudes like that their style becomes yeah. their movies and they're the movie they're the stars of the movie and he's becoming one of those guys so I'm all on board it's one of my most anticipated films now after watching this trailer David yeah that's big buy for me as well I, I love the look of it the atmosphere I, I assumed when I first saw the trailer I was like there's got to be a Cormac McCarthy book just mm-hmm. because of the, he's so obsessed with the, the decay of the Southwest, and you know, of course, that Ridley Scott, you know, uh, film that, that, that didn't do too well. It was the last Cormac McCarthy. This isn't him, but it just looks like that. It looks incredible, and Benicio is on point. I buy Emily Blunt every single time I see her in a movie. Uh, I think I first fell in love with her, if I can say that, was in Devil Wears Prada. Mm-hmm. When she did that back with uh, Anne Hathaway, uh, she was fantastic in there. And then, of course, with Live, Die, Repeat or, or Edge of Tomorrow, whatever you want to call it, she was fantastic in there. She is one of the premier female uh, leads out there right now. And you also see it with um, my uh, kind of, I don't know, throwing back to True Detective season two coming out with Rachel McAdams, mm-hmm. that story of a, a cop kind of just on the edge, as Christian said, on the edge. And they look like they're going to mirror each other well, even though one's on TV and one's on film. Well, you know, it actually reminds me of that TV show, The Bridge on oh, FX, because yeah. yeah. that, mm-hmm. that was about the border between mm-hmm. Mexico and the U.S. and a lot of drug smuggling. And Diane Kruger well. was in there, another uh, yeah. great female actor. Yeah. 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 All, right, all right, what is next? The trailer for Rob- Robin Williams' final on-screen performance in the film Boulevard has been released. Though Williams was mostly known for his comedic performances, this film shows off his dramatic side, much like his Oscar-winning work in Goodwill Hunting. In it, Williams-, Williams plays Nolan, a man who seems to be living a normal life with a well-paying job and an uneventful marriage. However, deep down, Nolan is struggling with being gay and has to confront the secret when he picks up a troubled young man off the streets. Boulevard is being directed by Dito Montiel and comes to theaters in limited release release on July 17th. Christian, do you buy or sell the trailer? I meant buy the trailer, and it, it broke my heart to watch it, just watching uh, Robin Williams, knowing that this is going to be the last time that we see him. I don't know how I felt about, and I always, and it's just maybe it's just me, but when they when a, a studio promotes, like, in his final dramatic performance, and I'm like, don't do not do that. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't need to do that. We, we know. We know that he's not here anymore. Um, but the movie itself... I, I think that this was when, when Robin, going back to what we just said about Del Toro, when, when Robin Williams was on and when he hit you with the dramatic, he, you just care about him so much. And you care, he, he just was, you felt like you, know, you knew him. And so to watch this character go from these struggles, and, he, and, he, and Robin Williams is also a guy that could really have a powerful message 
in, inside of his performances, and that's what this movie looks like. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm curious to how it's going to turn out, and I hope I hope it's it's great enough to where we can honor him at the Oscars. I'm hoping we'll see. Uh, I you know it was sad to see Robin Williams uh, on this, but purely based on the trailer itself, I'm kind of on the fence because it's one of those movies that that looks like oh if they do it right it can be really good right. but it has a, a high chance of being coming off hokey or cheesy but i am gonna buy it because robin williams like you said he's known for his comedic performances but when he does drama he's done it pretty well especially mm -hmm. in goodwill hunting in also the director dito montiel i think is his name he directed uh, his directorial debut was Guide to Recognizing Your oh, Saints. Yeah, yeah. And that's a movie not a lot of people saw, but I really enjoyed it. And it's a movie I point to all the time about, oh, you don't think Shia LaBeouf can act? You don't think Channing Tatum can act? Go watch that movie. Yeah. You know, he they do they both do a fantastic job. And I think if if this director can pull those type of performances out of someone like Robin Williams, I think this is going to be a, a pretty good movie, David. Yeah, I have to have to buy it with Robin Williams, and it, I, I'm really curious about the relationship between the male, the, the prostitute, and him. It looks like they're both one seemingly has a good life, the other obviously coming from the wrong neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. But you can tell they're both broken men, mm -hmm. and how they can maybe help heal each other. I don't know if that's going to be the aim of the story. And hey, maybe in the end, maybe they both have horrible lives. Maybe they find redemption. Maybe not. I mean, who knows what kind of ending that's going to get? But I I want to see that journey. I want to see where Robin Williams takes us with that performance. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? The first trailer for Dark Places, starring Mad Max Fury Road co-star Charlize Theron and Nicholas Holt, has been released. The film is based on the best-selling novel by Gillian Flynn, who also wrote last year's hit movie Gone Girl, directed by David Fincher. In this movie, Theron plays a woman who, as a child, survives a terrible incident that involved her brother killing her mother and two sisters. Her testimony sent her brother to prison for life, but 25 years later, she must revisit this painful memory and re-examine what happened. The film also stars Corey Stoll, Christina Hendricks, Chloe Grace Moretz, and Ty Sheridan, with Gilles Paquet Brenner directing. Dark Places comes to AMC Theaters on August 7th. David, did you buy or sell the trailer? Buy the trailer for several reasons. One, it's nice to see Christina Hendricks getting work. I'm a huge Mad Men fan, and that's off TV right now, so I'm glad she's working. Uh, I love Corey Stoll. I know we have Charlize in here. Uh, Nicholas Holt's awesome. You know, is you know from X Men and everything mm -hmm. else he's been doing in Mad Max. But uh, Corey Stoll's one of those guys. I don't know if he'll ever blow up. I mean, mm -hmm. no, he's going to be an Ant Man. He's going to be the villain. But he's just always one of those character actors. Every time I see him in something, right now he's on The Strain on FX, which is a Guillermo del Toro produced television show. It's very entertaining, and he's he's excellent in that. Everything I've seen him in, I'm never disappointed with him. So because Corey Stoll's on, I mean, there's tons of other great actors and actresses in here. But I'm going to buy it because of him. I'm looking forward to this movie. I mean, I really liked Gone girl but i have to sell this trailer I, I feel like it was poorly put together it looks like they kind of just if i didn't read the synopsis before i saw the trailer i'm not sure if i knew <laughs> would know what was going on it they kind of just pieced together all these scenes and then in that line um nicholas holt's character says uh we solve crimes that's just what we do i'm like that's terrible yeah. it's terrible so f for that reason even though i want to see this movie i I don't like this trailer, Christian. I'm with you. I, I really want to see the movie. I'm going to sell the trailer because it was it was a sloppy trailer. I thought, um, but what I, as I'm watching it, the reason I really want to see it, and, I, and I'm sold if, if it was a buy or sell as far as on the movie, but huge buy yeah. still because of the performances. If you look, replace all of these actors that are in this movie with not good actors, yeah. and be, even though the story, you'd say, oh, the story's okay. It's the matter because you see all these actors, like you said, Corey Stoll and Charlie Theron on that back and forth on the prison, on that right there, he, visiting him in prison. That's what I want to see because of them. Um, Nicholas Holt leading this kind of un undercover kitty crime <laughs> detective ring, whatever it is. It's like that. Um, that's interesting because of Nicholas Holt. So I think because the, what they did really well so far was casting. And I think the reason I really want to see this is to see Charlize Theron again in this. In the fact that I guess the Gone Girl is the same writer as Gone Girl. Yeah. I love Gone Girl. So, All right. Uh, that's it. Uh, we're moving on to our mailbag segment. Remember, you can send in questions to amcmovietalk at gmail.com and we pick out a few and answer them. Sinead, what do we got? Grant Leatherow writes, What recent movies, less than 10 years old, do you think could be looked back on as movies the critics got wrong at the time of their releases? Uh, usually for me, when critics don't like a movie, I'm pretty much in agreement with them. It's usually when, when I disagree with critics is when they praise or overpraise certain mm -hmm. movies. So three movies that come to mind are, um, and they're all Academy Award winners, Crash, 
mm. Hurt Locker, and uh, The Artist are three movies. Not that I hated those movies. I just didn't think they were as good as, as, as people were saying. Crash was... I felt not subtle at all. It was very like, you know, with the scenarios uh, and talking about racism, it was just very, very heavy handed. Um, the Hurt Locker was very good in terms of um, tension and the action, all that stuff, but it had some pretty weak dialogue in it. And then the artist, the movie I liked and enjoyed, I just didn't feel like if you had taken this movie, if it wasn't uh, black and white and silent, you take that movie, put it back in, in like the 20s. People who seen it back then probably would have liked it, enjoyed it, but they wouldn't have gone gaga over it because they, they see that on a daily basis. I don't know. Christian, what are your thoughts? I'm just going one, and I'm going popcorny, and I think that the critics were way too hard on Entourage. Um, oh, so I agree with you. I think because if you are a fan of that television show, it did everything that it was supposed to do. It had like 20% or 30% on, on, on Rotten Tomatoes, and I think that's silly. I think that people were watching that. you got to watch it as a four-episode arc. And that's what it is. And I think that if you watch that movie, you can have fun with it. I think sometimes people look a little too, especially critics, look too deep into things. So it was just the one that came out, uh, came up to mind to me. But there, I'm sure there are a ton of other ones. David? Uh, both my films are in the science fiction genre. And to be fair, they, they did okay. Uh, I'm looking at uh, Sunshine and Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Both, if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, uh, whatever scale you want to use on that, it's, it's they're both in the 70 percent centile. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're not like the majority of critics hated them, but right. there was just a lot of, you know, just... Just you know, bad you know articles written about those saying like, oh, it didn't fulfill what, especially with Prometheus, like what Alien did. I think people were expecting to see Alien and Aliens, you know, just done over again. I'm like, no, Ridley Scott tried to do something different. I think he, I thought it was inventive. I was curious about that movie, Sunshine. I thought it was fantastic. A lot of the critics didn't like the last 20 minutes that it turned into a horror film, but I actually liked that. Enjoyed just the whole aspect of that movie that Danny Boyle crafted. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's science fiction. Those two films, I think, were just criticized a little too harshly a movie for me that only did okay by the critics was a uh, session nine by brad anderson it's a it's like a psychological thriller slash horror very inspired by the kubrick's the shining i think it only got like 63 percent or something like that on rotten tomatoes but i thought it was very excellent i guess maybe because that's kind of what i'm looking for from a horror movie in, instead of like blood and guts and stuff like that so all right what's next Ali Machiavelli writes, There are so many directors in the movie world, and it seems like they all like to put a signature in the movies they direct. For example, Michael Bay's Explosions, Tim Burton's Gothic Style, etc. I understand they want to stand out, but do you think it's affecting the movies they're supposed to be directing? They should be allowed to use their style in movies they write, but not in the movies they don't. This way, the movie will come first and not be ruined because of their egos. Thoughts? Well, I don't necessarily think that them writing it has to do whether or not whether they should use their signature style on it. But I do I do get your point in terms of sometimes the style shouldn't over overcome the the actual story, you know? And that's kind of one of the reasons why I don't care much for Michael Bay, because he has a signature style, right? And he doesn't care what the story is or what the scene in particular is about. He just does his style no matter what. And so one of his signature moves is like a, a 360 pan, right, around a, a character, yeah. which is fine if it's like a, a big moment they build up to and the heroes are about to go out into battle. He does it for everything. Yeah. Like in, in Transformers Age of Extinction, like Mark Wahlberg's just sitting on the farm and they're, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like for every, you can't do that for, for every single scene or every single scenario because then it loses weight because when you do it again later, it doesn't mean anything. And yeah. so I feel like directors should uh, keep their signature style but like kind of temper it and, and, and fit it towards whatever movie they're actually doing. A good example of that is uh, Martin Scorsese and Kundun. Uh, if you've ever seen that movie, it definitely has some of his styli stylistic techniques that he uses, but he tempers it down. Like he uses far less cuts he uses more dissolves a the steady cam work is a little more reserved so I, I feel like you can do that but just temper it down i don't know what do you guys think well it mm -hmm. goes back to what we were just saying though before with, with villanueva as far as there's the directors that you know and a really great director makes you go oh this is definitely one of his movies it's like it's an artist you know it's their movies but like you just mentioned with scorsese they're able to change it up michael bay would know how to change yeah. it up if he tried uh Tim Burton has has changed it up, even though a lot of times you know right away that he, and he was getting into that same the same problem where you just knew everything was just he was repeating. But that last movie, you know, the one with Christoph Waltz, Big, Big, Big Eyes, 
which a lot of people didn't like, but it was a different. It was different. There were a lot of things that he did that was different. He's done that before, um, so I think he is one of those guys that can change it up. It's a really good director. Is able to absolutely echo what Dennis just said, and that's let you know that it's his movie but still show you some things different. And I think Tarantino's a great example of that. He always, even though you know, it's because a lot of times you know because of his dialogue as well too, but you know that the way he shoots ends up, oh, this is a Tarantino film, but you always feel like you're watching something new. And I think Matthew Vaughn's another guy that does that, does that as well too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, sorry, I'm going to use a sports analogy. It's like a it's basketball coach. When you watch a Phil Jackson team play, they're going to run the triangle offense. Mm -hmm. But in that triangle offense, Michael Jordan... Kobe Bryant are going to have the freedom to do what they need to do. That means the other players and pieces have to make that up. Phil Jackson can't just overpower everything and just do everything. So I think it doesn't, like you said, Dennis, it doesn't always save it when there's a writer-director. I mean, I think whenever I see a Tarantino film, Paul Thomas Anderson, I was like, could maybe trim just 10, 15 minutes off. <laughs> right, I mean, right. it's great. I mean, Tarantino loves his voice, and he has a beautiful voice, but it's like maybe just trim 10, 15 minutes off. And just because a, a writer and director are doing the same thing, it doesn't mean it's going to be saved because of that. Yeah, and also I think... <clears throat> Being a writer and directing a movie you wrote doesn't necessarily mean you you know get to do whatever you want stylistically. You know if if Tarantino decides to write a period piece for some reason, he shouldn't have this over the top bombastic style when he's doing this period piece, unless it's like Pride and Prejudice with zombies or something <laughs> like that, and he's like killing the stuff. But mm. you, you know what I mean. All right, that's it for today's show. I want to thank everyone on the panel. Uh, David, where can people find you? You can find me right here on AMC Coming Soon with Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis, as well as on Twitter at GriffinDE and on YouTube at Think Hero Pro. Christian? You can find me, like uh, David said, at Coming Soon or at Jedi Council AMC. But if you guys would please go to YouTube.com slash SchmoesNo, hit that subscribe button, help us get to 200,000 before Comic-Con, because we will be there, unlike Sony and uh, Paramount. <laughs> <laughs> and Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on all social media and YouTube at Sinead DeFreeze and at ThatSoSinead.com. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG, or on YouTube, Think Hero Pro. And don't forget to subscribe to the AMC Theaters YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash AMC Theaters. And check out the website, www.amctheaters.com, for all your showtimes and ticket information. Go check out Inside Out. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to check out Dope as well. So we'll see you guys next week.